poems have a way of being like a little earworm. That's why we remember them. They're small enough usually, short enough usually, tight enough usually, and surprising enough usually to stick. And you suddenly find yourself years later, where did I, how did I remember that? Where did that come from? Hey everyone, I'm Bianca Schultz from the Children's Book Review, and this is the Growing Readers Podcast, your go-to podcast for inspiring conversations with creators and change makers in the world of children's literature. Today, I have the pleasure of hosting a true luminary in the world of children's books. It's Jane Yolen. Born and raised in the vibrant city of New York, Jane now calls Hatfield, Massachusetts and Mystic, Connecticut home. A graduate of Smith College with a master's degree in education from the University of Massachusetts, Jane Yolen's illustrious career has earned her six honorary doctorates from esteemed New England colleges and universities. With a body of work comprising well over 400 books, Jane Yolen is a literary force to be reckoned with. What sets Jane's writing apart is its deep connection to her roots, her family, and her personal experiences. Take, for instance, The Emperor and the Kite, a Caldecott honor book in 1968, which draws from her relationship with her father, an international kite-flying champion. Or consider Owl Moon, recipient of the 1988 Caldecott Medal, inspired by her husband's passion for birding. Jane Yolen's stories and poems resonate with readers of all ages, weaving together themes of family, adventure, and imagination. Her books come to life in a way that captivates the hearts and minds of children and adults alike. So get ready to embark on a poetic journey with the incomparable Jane Yolen. Before we dive in, here's the synopsis for her latest book, In and Out the Window. The largest single anthology of Jane Yolen's poetry, containing more than 100 poems for all occasions, with fun black and white art throughout. Our kitchen smells of mornings, blueberry muffins, hot chocolate, tea. It smells of bacon and of eggs. It smells of family. For the first time, legendary author Jane Yolen gathers the largest single anthology of her poetry celebrating childhood. At home or at school, playing sports or practicing music, enjoying the holidays or delighting in each season, Jane Yolen's masterful collection shows just how lively it is to be a kid. With a whimsical artwork by Catherine Petersland, this collection of more than 100 poems is a classic that children are sure to return to again and again. Well, hello, Jane Yolen. Welcome to the Growing Readers Podcast. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. I have so many great questions to ask you, but I thought maybe because you're such a well-known and prolific author, poet, children's book writer, that I would love to start with a really general question. And that is, what's something that you do in your everyday routine that you think would either surprise us or really just resonate as something we all do? Well, for years... For years, I wrote a poem a day and sent it out. By by years, I mean 18 years. I wrote a poem a day and sent it out to um, over a thousand subscribers. I wasn't getting money for it. I just loved to write poems. And for me, writing a poem a day was a little bit like getting your fingers working, getting your brain working. Uh, was a little go start. You know, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna make it again today, and. After about 18, 19 years, I got a little tired. 
tired of doing that. So now I write what I call an occasional poem, which I send out on the occasion. In those 18 years when you did it every single day, was there a specific part of the day that you did it or it was just when you could fit it in? First thing in the morning, because I could sleep all day if you let me, but I I needed something that said it was a wake-up call. And this was a wake-up call, not just to wake up, but to wake the brain up and the fingers uh, so that they worked in coordination. All right. Well, we often hear that to be a writer, that you need to be a reader first. I'm curious if you agree with that. And do you consider yourself a reader just as much as a writer? As a child, I would have considered myself as such. These days, I'm 85 and I just broke my my hip. So I'm walking around on a cane. Um, I'm not reading as much because I had what was evidently something called amnesia that you get from anesthesia. You can get from mm-hmm. anesthesia. So my reading skills have taken a huge step backwards, but my writing skills are still there. I, I'm not quite sure why, um, but I'm thankful for that. Yeah, well, we're thankful for that, too. And I I hope that your hip improves. And that does not sound very fun. I I think it is. I've been going to PT. Good. We'll keep that up for sure. I'm wondering if you can recall a specific moment, either in your childhood or in adulthood, when you felt like you truly identified as a reader. My parents were both huge readers, both of them writers of different kinds. My father wrote for the newspapers, um, but he also was a a public relations man. So he wrote those kinds of things. My mother wrote short stories. Uh, She only sold, I think, one or two in her life, but she also every day worked on the New York Times crossword puzzle. So we had books everywhere and all their friends seemed to be, all their adult friends seemed to be readers. So somehow as a a youngish child, not small, small, but maybe about five, four or five, I got it in my head that all grownups were writers because all of their friends were writers too. I assumed, I mean, I I, I knew that we lived in New York City. I could see uh, taxi drivers and bus drivers and I could see people who had had uh, stores and all that, I assumed they went home at night and wrote because that's what my parents did and that's what their friends did. So it wasn't a huge step to think that's what I was going to do um, as when I grew up, which meant I had to read to yeah. learn how to write. So I was reading very young. Um, And I was writing very young. I wrote my first poem uh, in first grade. It was terrible. (laughs) I could even recite it to you, but it was terrible. I mean, it was a one year, you know, it was a first grade, grade's poem. Um, But that made me understand that you can write poems, even if you're a kid. Um, I I wrote the class play. Uh, we were all some kind of vegetable and ended up in salads and soup together. I love it. I was the, I was the chief carrot because, of course, you know, if you're going to write a play, you might as well write the best part for yourself. Absolutely. Um, so I was writing and getting awarded, in a sense, uh, very young. It's it's like it's seems like it's completely in your fiber just to be immersed in in words and language. And I think that's so wonderful. I I wanted to ask you, tell me if my number is wrong, but you have over 400 published books. Is that correct? Or 57, I think, which yeah. is absolutely incredible. And oh, wait see- a minute, wait a minute. There are 30 more that have sold. Oh, my goodness. Come out. So, and I'm writing on new ones now that haven't sold yet. So that's incredible, Jane. And so, when you said that your mom only maybe sold one or two, I was wondering, do you know how she felt about you and and the success that you have? Did she get to see it? Well, this is this is both a nice and a sad story. My father never read a book of mine. He said they're not real books. 
because they were for children. Or when I wrote a couple of novels, they were science fiction. He was not interested. So he said they were not books and he didn't read them. Um, he did read everything my brother wrote. My brother was um, uh, and still is um, somebody who writes uh, news news reports, who who was at one point head of the of, of an overseas um broadcasting um so so <sighs> there is that my mother read everything in manuscript and talked to me about them and we would talk about it and she was the one who would tell all her friends all their friends my new book she would push the book she had copies of the book because i gave them always the copies of any new books she would keep them on on the um right there on on a, a table and if one of their friends would come she would say this is jane's new book and at one point one woman um came who said oh you know she went sort of oh that's nice but she didn't even open the book because she was an ad- writing for adults and my mother said read the book so it was a picture book so the woman under my mother's eye sat there and read the book. And then she looked up and she said, but this is a real story. And my mother said, yes, it is. Oh, my God. So that was the difference between my parents and their responses to my being a writer. I'm not sure if I just wrote adult books, my father would have liked them. I think he was just more interested in, in what my brother was writing that's fine. My brother was doing good writing too. Yeah. I love that perspective on it. And I just, I love when you sort of told us about your dad and, and you finished it with, and so there's that. (laughs) And I, you obviously you've compartmentalized that section and just, I'm grateful that your mom really nourished you. And, and, and I think that's wonderful. I think moms are so, so good at doing that. I am curious because you do write for adults and for children. What is it that really fuels your passion for creating books specifically tailored for children? So what's your driving force for writing when you write for children? I'd like to tell a story. And and um, maybe I just have a very short idea of story. Maybe I'm still left back in childhood. Um, but the stories that I have brought forward that I still remember are stories like um, Lewis Carroll's stories or all the Arthurian legends or all the fairy tales that I ever read. So those are the ones that are closest to my heart. And so I want to write, I want to be in that group. I want to be the Hans Christian Andersen of America or or, um, you know, the Lewis Carroll of America. I want to be able to be that person who can tell those stories that live so long that the children of the next and the next and the next generations will recite them. I mean, I can stand up in front of a group of of people um, and, and go and 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 do half of uh, Lewis Carroll, just uh, twas brillig. And the slithy toves did gyre and gibble in the wave, all mimsy with the boar groves and the momraths of grave. No one had me remind, to, had to, told me I had to remember that story. Nobody said I had to present that 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 uh, poem in school. I loved it so much and read it so often that I can tell it now and I'm 85. I don't know if you can tell, but like just uh, that response just made my eyes water because you are that person for so many. And I love that. <laughs> I can't believe you just cited that to me. I mean, this is incredible. I, I, lo- I love this. And it's like what I said before, that literature and words and storytelling is in every fiber of you. It's magical. But I have to tell you that I'm not the only one. I was um, last year or the year before was invited to a Smith College, I'm a Smith College, um, uh, was was my college, um, to a, a kind of reunion performance of various writers and, and poets to come and read something of their own and a favorite poem of theirs. 
And I said I wanted I would read Emily Dickinson. Uh, and and they said, well, we already have some several people doing Emily Dickinson. Can you choose some something else? And I said, well, OK, I will do the Jabberwocky. And she said, well, you can do it. Emily Dickinson and a Jabberwocky because <laughs> Jabberwocky was clearly not as far up on her list as it was on mine. And when it was my turn, I did, I did the the um, Dickinson with my favorite Dickinson, um, which is tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in uh, what is it? Success in circuit lies, which I love the way lies is kind of stuck in there. Um, but then I said, but here's the poem I really want to, and I was the last person to do it. We really want to do it. And I started the Jabberwocky and the entire, the entire group of must have been 200 people in the audience started reciting it with me. That's incredible. I, I feel like the energy in that room would have been just so amazing to experience. And I think that's the power of anything written for children, I mean, I think sometimes, and, and you're welcome to agree or disagree, that writing for children is actually harder than writing for adults because you're trying to create something that is easier maybe to digest, but as equally as profound. And I think anything that we also read as as children ourselves that, that hits us in the heart or in the mind, it does, it stays with us. And I think that experience in that room is evidence of that. Yeah, yeah. And that, that would not have been a poem that people of my age and slightly younger who were out in the audience would have had to memorize in school. Uh, we would have had to memorize some, you know, some lofty, high level stuff. This was stuff we read so often, it became part of our DNA. Yeah. And you read it so often by choice, not because somebody was telling you to do it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Poetry can sometimes seem a bit daunting for those who aren't familiar with the genre or as familiar with the genre. Do you have any friendly advice or strategies that you could share to help readers approach and enjoy poetry more easily? Well, in in this new book, uh, Inside and Outside, um, that I did of poems, I actually have poems about how to read a poem, how to write a poem, how to feel a poem, how to move with a poem. I mean, so I think the book itself has moments where it it speaks to that very thing. I think that reading a poem out loud as opposed to reading it quietly, um, both are good. But if you read it out loud, you hear all the resonances in your ears. If you only read it by sight, you are missing, I would say, a good half of what a poem is about. You're somebody who has certainly mastered the art of poetry. So what do you think are the key ingredients that make a poem really sing? And do you have a secret source of your own when crafting your own poetry? Well, I'm, I don't worry about rhyme. I mean, I can rhyme standing on my head. My my husband and I, he's also a poet, we'll be driving around in the car and we start playing rhyme games with one another as 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 we're going along. Sometimes I think, though, that the most wonderful poems uh, are the ones that surprise you. The end line of um, one of my favorite poems talks about a, a monster that is slouching towards Bethlehem to be born. And that gives me the shivers every time I think of the ending, because it's not what you were expecting that 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 monster, it, it, its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. All you have thought about in your in your consideration of Bethlehem and something being born in Bethlehem is not a monster, right? 
you know, and it blows the top of your head off. What is he saying? What is he telling us in that poem? Um, you know, Yeats is really, really one of those sneaky poets who gets behind you and pushes you up the hill to new discoveries. Speaking of new discoveries, can I tell you my, my Yeats my, my, my uh, Yates moment. Absolutely, you can. Um, we were my my um, late husband and I were driving in in on a trip all the way through Ireland, and we'd been in the car for a while. And I said, oh, "I've got to get out of the car and walk a little bit." And then there was a little small little um, church with a little graveyard. And I love old graveyards because, you know, you can you can read the stones and they tell you wonderful stories. And so I got out and as I'm walking around, I stumbled over a rock, put my hand out onto one of the gravestones and my face came face to face to it and it said, horseman, pass by. I went, horseman, pass by. That's a line by Yates. And then I stood back and it was Yeats's gravestone. I had stumbled in the middle of Ireland, where I had never been before. I had stumbled over Yeats's gravestone. And I was just, this is telling me something. I need to go read more Yeats, try to write like Yeats a little more. It was, it was astonishing. Yeah, I'm sitting here thinking, like, did, did you did you have any idea that Yates's gravestone was even in in that cemetery? No, no idea. No, no. I mean, didn't even know what the church's name was. Wow. It was just a little church. I needed to get out and walk. That's all. Here's a graveyard. Can I get out and walk? Um, that was that was the entire conversation between my husband and me. It's OK. So he he got out, stood out. And looked like that, but he was not folded his arms. He was not interested in walking around the graveyard. But I'm a graveyard, you know, walker, uh, and um, there it was. I want to take a little tangent because now that I know that you're a graveyard walker, which I did not know before, I recently read an article that, you know, everybody has their own love language. For me and my family, it's reading. And I imagine that my gravestone will have some sort of like literature quotes on it. Others obviously put it like a line of poetry. But I realized that love like, like cooking is a big love language for people. And I didn't know that some gravestones have like a family recipe on them. And there are people that walk around <laughs> cemeteries looking for family recipes to to write down. Um, I never I, heard of that. Oh, my goodness. Well, now now like that's I I was like, that is that true? I don't know. So you don't know either. I don't know either, but it might become a poem very soon. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Family. Like, I feel as though gravestones are probably a really good representation of what each individual's love language is, like how they gave to the, to their community and their family. So whether it's poetry, cooking, reading, you know, whatever that might be. But anyway, that's so fascinating that you're a graveyard walker. I love that. I have often thought that my gravestone should read, she wrote many good books and one, one great one, and just leave it at that and let people guess or fight over it or um, argue it or write an essay on which one was the great one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I can tell you that my my uh, my children would probably tell you it's how do dinosaurs say good night? That, that was <laughs> they're all old, older now and, and onto novels and uh, even adult books. But I, you know, that that story was a staple in our house. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That 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 like this new book was something that was pushed by an editor. I had an editor who called me up, a friend who she was also a close friend. I used to be an editor too, so I had many friends in publishing who were editors. And she said, "My little boy Robbie is three. He loves dinosaurs, and he hates to go to bed at night. Can you do something for him? Write something for him." And I said, "I'll send him a little poem." And I wrote, 
how does a dinosaur say goodnight? It was just a poem. And she called back um, about a half hour later and she said, it worked. She said, he's fast asleep now. He loved the poem, but it's not a poem. I said, of course it's a poem. She said, no, it's a book and I'm publishing it. Yes. <laughs> I, I love that story. I love that. I mean, I, I love the way it came about and I love the actual book itself. So between all of you, I was, you know, I feel like it's what so many moms and dads needed to, to tuck their kids in. I feel like we need to dive in now to this new book, In and Out the Window. And you already touched on this, but they are some sneaky hidden lessons on the why and the when and the how to write poetry and how to read poetry. And it's kind of sprinkled throughout in and out the window. So do you want to share the inside scoop on how you chose to weave these little nuggets of wisdom into your poetry collection? In in some ways, I'm a, a poetry lover. In other way, in other ways, I'm a poetry pusher. And in some ways, I see poetry as a sneaky way of getting into literature, life works, uh, surprising storylines, etc. And I didn't want the book to be just poems about inside and outside. I really wanted there to be um, something more that kind of anchored it. And it was when I thought of that, I thought, how do I anchor this? And I said, I'm going to write, just as I write a poem a day, I'm going to write a poem for, you know, each, each section about poetry, because there are many ways of dealing with poems. There are many ways of learning about poems, and there are many ways of reading poems. And I wanted to talk about all of them as I went along. So they're, they're sort of like little, the poems about Poetry are like little nuggets or maybe little bananas that you can peel, you know, each time you go through and find something good and yummy underneath. And uh, it was also a way to end a section. Uh, otherwise, I mean, I could have gone on and on and on and on and on. And so I wanted to do something that that. You could look forward to ending that, oh, this is the end of this section because here's the poem about poetry. Yeah, clever. And just further proof, not that anybody needs any proof that you are indeed a poet, but I love little nuggets of wisdom and I always call them little nuggets of wisdom. But I loved that you just called it a banana that you peel back and inside is that little special treat. I mean, that was such a great description. So thank you for saying that. I loved that. I would love to know with this sort of collection and there's new poems in there there's poems that were previously published elsewhere in there how did you decide which poem to kick off the entire book when i was writing the book it came in sections and and i didn't write it from top to bottom i write it oh let me work on this section oh i know i oh that really belongs in that section over there um so uh it was not it, it was it was easy but it was not pretty putting it together because i had old poems and new poems and sometimes i was rewriting old poems to make them fit more easily under the under the uh that particular place and and it also went so fast i think that what jill santapolo who was the editor of the book i think was was expecting you know a years long slog through it and and suddenly there she had it in her lap very quickly thereafter because i had so many books all and so many poems already written I think sometimes it's easy from the outside to think that a book comes together, you know, in such a linear, easy way, but it doesn't always. Like sometimes it is sort of tricky, but then when the puzzle pieces all fit, then it just suddenly all clicks together in, in a short It looks time. better from the outside than it was from the inside when I was working on it. Um, but then, but the, but the other thing about working on this particular book was that Yes, I had a lot of old poems I could put in. Some of them were published, some of them were unpublished. But 
Then I had to write new poems. And I had little corners and little special places where it needed this kind of poem, or a poem about poetry, for example. And that was fun because it pushed me to writing new poems I might have never written at all. In your experience, how do you think poetry serves as a handy tool for teaching and learning? And how do you see, in particular, in and out the window, fitting into children's literacy and creativity in a classroom? Well, to begin with, poems are usually short, especially poems for children. I'm not getting into the big long poems and the the Odyssey and the Iliad and all of that sort of stuff. Poems for children are normally pretty short. And because they're short, they can be like, like a little piece of wisdom from the teacher to the child or from the child, from the page to the child. And I think in this book, those little poems of wisdom are the, are. are seen very easily in the poems that are about how to read a poem, how to write a poem, how to hear a poem, how to feel a poem. Those tell you pretty succinctly something. They're still poetic, but they're also telling you. They're giving you um, they're giving you stairs and stepways up to the poems themselves. But I think also poems have a way of being like a little earworm. That's why we remember them. They're small enough, usually, short enough, usually, tight enough, usually, and surprising enough, usually, to stick. And you suddenly find yourself years later, where did I, how did I remember that? Where did that come from? I can't think of many lines in books I can remember. I can remember the opening of a couple of of novels, but but... That's not the same as remembering an entire poem. A poem is is like a blossom that's opened up. And you can you can close it back down again in a sense and remember certain lines, but they lead you to opening up the whole thing again. It doesn't happen with a novel. The novel really takes time, substantial time to read, and most of it you'll forget. You'll forget moments, moments of horror, moments of love, moments of movement. Um, But you're not likely to remember a lot of particular lines in a novel. You are going to remember particular lines in a poem. Um, And they become watchwords for you. Looking ahead, when readers have this book in their hand, In and Out the Window, So I'm wondering whether those readers are young or young at heart, what do you hope will be the lasting impact on them? One of the things that I think that the book does is it doesn't just show one kind of poem. It shows many different kinds of poems. There are poems that rhyme. There are poems that don't rhyme. There are poems that are almost like little jokes. There are poems that... Uh, like the one about Martin Luther King, uh, there are some poems there that can be acted out. There are some poems there that need to be shouted. So I think there's enough variety in the book to cover an awful lot of uh, poetry to be taught. There are books, big books that are very successful, and rightfully so, of poetry that are um, funny, amusing, uh, or serious, not amusing, that can be interesting to read, uh, can be respected, can be um, favorites. I think what this book is, is a combination, because there are some very serious poems, like the, the line goes on. There are some very humorous poems about child in school, or child discovering in school that they're really in school for good reasons. There, are, So there are serious poems, there are funny poems, there are deep poems, there are not deep poems, there are two-line poems. Uh, there's a little bit of everything. So I think that it's a kind of poetry book that you could have open for reading in a classroom 
And uh, people could tell you, oh, this is my favorite or that's my favorite. No, they may not. Nobody else is favorite. So it's a kind of practice for reading poetry the rest of your life. Before we wrap up, Jane, do you have any pro tips or friendly advice for aspiring poets maybe looking to sharpen their skills or maybe even just some words of wisdom for those just dipping their toes into the world of poetry? I think, first of all, you know, the toes in the water is important. If you have never read poetry, don't just try putting stuff together. Uh, You don't know what poetry is. Pick three, four poems, uh, poets, and and look at what they've done. And you see how also they don't repeat themselves. Um, They may be reinventing themselves. Emily Dickinson reinvented herself every time she wrote another poem. So, So I think that you need whether you're an adult or a child, whether you're a teacher or a student, you need to be reading broadly in poetry. And you need to be reading both silly and serious. You need to be reading uh, both for grown-ups and for kids. You need to be reading rhymed and unrhymed. You need to be reading aloud and then reciting it to yourself quietly. Because the ear and the eye are different listeners. Or have somebody else read it to you. And that voice will become the voice of the poem for you. I think that almost took us full circle in the sense that to be a writer, that it's important to be a reader, either, you know, first or in sync with. So I think that was important. Well, Jane, I love to ask this question right before we go, and that is... What would you pick to be one big takeaway from our conversation today for the listeners? If they just were to take take away one thing that we talked about today, what would you want that to be? Read a poem out loud to yourself every morning Perfect. or every night. Jane, you have no idea how special this was for me to be able to connect with you, not just by written words on the paper, but, you know, face to face through our computer screens. I mean, you are an absolute delight. It is clear that words and language and and poetry runs through your veins. And I really, really enjoyed reading In and Out the Window. And my, my favorite parts were always those ending poems on, on how to write, how to read, uh, when to write. And, you know, I mean, I'm not going to give any spoilers away, but there's little great little tips in there. But also there is no wrong or right way to write a poem. You know, it just, it's just what it's what's coming from your heart. And what comes from your heart, Jane, is beautiful. And I'm so glad that you share it with the world. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us on this quest for growing readers. To learn more about Jane Yolen and her captivating body of work, visit her online at janeyolen.com. Be sure to check out our show notes. You'll find links to order copies of In and Out the Window. And remember... If you love listening to the Growing Readers podcast, you can hear it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you enjoy listening. Be sure to follow and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform to get new episodes as soon as they launch. If you're enjoying our book chats, please leave us a review. And while you're at it, grab your phone and text a friend you know who would love to listen to this episode. The Growing Readers Podcast is a production of the Children's Book Review. To find more books, just like Jane Yolen's, in and out the window, I hope you'll visit us at thechildrensbookreview.com.